Hello everyone. We are going to listen now Spy Spy Open Source SPI Flash Emulation by Trammell. So I'm really glad that everyone is here today to uh, learn about the Spy Spy Flash Emulator. It's a project I've been working on for the past uh, few months. And it's an uh, open source tool that lets us more quickly work with uh, spy flashes. And hopefully, at the end of the talk, you'll understand what those are, why we're doing it, and how it works. So first, let's talk about what is a spy flash. And if we look at a motherboard, there are some small chips uh, on it that store the firmware that the CPU executes before it loads the operating system. And in days past, these were around 64 kilobytes, and they, they stored the BIOS. Uh, these days, there's a lot more complexity. Uh, typically, things like the, the closed source UEFI firmware. But there's also open source firmware, like Linux boot and uh, Core boot, that you can install into those flashes. If we get really close to the flash, we can make out the, the uh, part number, and we can look up that data sheet to find out some more about it. The, this gives us the definition of spy as serial peripheral interface, which is a pretty generic term. Uh, in this case, it, they're typically three, wire, three or four wires. It also tells us that the size of it is 128 megabits. Uh, this one's 16 megabytes, which may not seem like a lot in this modern era of uh, gigabyte or terabyte SD cards, but it's a huge step up from the 64K we used to have. So why do we want to emulate spy flashes? Well, if you're working on uh, d open source for firmware like Core Boot or Linux Boot, or if you're doing security research on the closed source things like UEFI, you end up having to reflash these chips a lot. In fact, I have spent an enormous amount of my time in the past few years reflashing these chips. Uh, and it is really, really slow. And you might think, it's only 16 megabytes. How slow could it be? And the problem is that these are designed to be ROMs. They're not designed to be updated all the time. So they haven't optimized for the write speed. You have to erase them four kilobytes at a time. And in the worst case, it's 120 milliseconds to erase a 4K uh, sector. So if we do the math, 120 milliseconds times 16 megs divided by four, we're talking about eight minutes to, uh, to rewrite one of these things. And that's an enormous amount of time to spend every time you want to reprogram it. So let's look at how this works out for the, uh, a day in the life of a core boot developer. You finally finished building core boot, and it's time to flash it. But first, you have to turn off the power to the machine you're going to flash, because uh, the flashes aren't multi-mastered. You then have to carefully attach your flash programmer, because most of the commercial flash programmers won't let you tri-state the lines, so you can't boot with them attached. And then you can finally run flash ROM to start flashing. The first bit goes pretty fast, because you probably haven't changed the management engine section, unless you're doing security research on that, which uh, I, I used to do as well. And then it hits the core boot part, and it has to start uh, erasing those blocks. And yeah, three minutes in, it's still slowly erasing and writing. Five minutes in, I mean, this is not the way you want to spend your day waiting uh, for these chips. So finally, five and a half minutes later, at uh, 49 kilobytes per second, we're talking about dial-up modem speeds. Uh, it's finally done flashing. But you're not done yet, because now you have to remove the, the uh, flash programmer clip from the board, power on the machine, and hopefully it boots. But if you've done firmware development, it probably doesn't. And you have to uh, rebuild and reflash. And you know, this, is, this is how I used to spend my day. And like they say on TV, there's got to be a better way. So what I want to show you today is a live demo. So can I get a volunteer? with a ThinkPad X220 or 230. Um, I can't promise it's not going to get bricked, but uh, <laughs> um, thus far I have not bricked any. But if, it, if, if I do brick it, uh, you can keep both pieces. So, yes. I, but I love it.
Thank you, sir. What I love about hacker conferences is, is there's always somebody willing to, uh, to, to jump up with that. So. I guess let's uh, first, let's boot it and see what it uh, comes up with. And this should just be the, uh, the, the stock firmware. UEFI takes a little while sometimes. Okay, this is the stock firmware. So we're gonna, we're gonna power it off. And the nice thing about the, uh, the X200s is the flash chip is very accessible. Uh, underneath the mouse pad. <laughs> You've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here we have the spy flash chip, and we have the spy spy. So we're going to attach it to it. Making sure to note uh, pin one is. Uh, the one with the uh, the dot on it. Okay, so I've uh, I've built a core boot image, and now we're going to we're going to upload it with the spy spy tool uh, in, into the into the board and put it in monitor mode. So this is going at USB serial speeds, about one megabyte per second. Okay, it's now in monitor mode, so when we turn on the machine, uh, we get a printout from a bunch of things, and now we have uh, CBIOS from uh, the core boot tree up and running. So this is way faster than uh, eight minutes. But wait, there's more. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, you frequently end up having to change these things all the time. And you know, when you're doing firmware development, you end up having to tweak them. So we're going we're gonna to modify the firmware. And we're going to rebuild a core boot in CBIOS. Okay. And now we're going to upload just the, uh, the core boot section. pretty fast. And now when we boot it, we're going to get something a little different. All right. So this is a way, if you're doing this sort of firmware development, this is a way to make it way, way faster and way more convenient. It also lets us start to think about adding other things like fuzzing and uh, continuous integration into our firmware development trays. So. Okay. That's enough for the demo. All right. So. Um, so we can skip the, uh, the parts about, you know, if it didn't work with the demo. So that loaded at uh, one megabyte per second, which was limited by the, uh, the USB serial port that we've implemented in the FPGA. We can definitely get a lot faster than that, but this is just worlds better, so haven't been motivated to really go into it that much yet. The other big difference is we can now soft reboot into these new firmwares. We don't necessarily have to power cycle. We don't have to keep removing the Flash programmer. So that, that also speeds up the time. The other really neat thing that this gives us is insight into what the CPU is doing when it starts up. Um, if you've just come here to Congress from the 1970s, you might think that the x86 loads the legacy reset vector uh, from the top of memory and, and jumps into it. But that's, that is no longer what actually happens. Um, so if you watched uh, the My Computer screen when the system was booting, it printed out a bunch of read addresses. And we can correlate those with what's in the ROM contents to see what the CPU is doing as it starts up. The first thing that happens is it loads the, uh, the, the platform controller hub, reads the Intel flash descriptor to determine what type of chip there is. Uh, then the Intel management engine uh, reads its firmware and gets run in. The 
ME starts the x86, but it doesn't go to the reset vector. Instead, CPU microcode uh, finds the firmware interface table, parses it, and then looks for microcode updates and applies them to the CPU. Um, if you have a boot guard equipped CPU, which this one is not, uh, the boot guard ACM is then uh, fetched, validated, and run. And then finally, uh, we get to the reset vector, and which jumps into the BIOS. Um, in this case, uh, 13,000 reads from the from the flash chip later. So, you know, the, the way systems have start up has completely changed. But we can now see that by watching uh, this. It's kind of like Wireshark for the uh, for the spy bus. If we plot those addresses uh, versus time, we also can find uh, some interesting patterns. So there's uh, addresses on the y-axis, uh, time on the x-axis, and I've colored the addresses based on uh, th if they're uh, the first time the address is read or the second time. So this linear scan uh, of, of those addresses is when Bucard is doing a signature check on part of the firmware, which means these rereads of those addresses are a time of check, time of use, security vulnerability, uh, potentially. And uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Peter Bosch, and I were able to uh, leverage that to get a, a root of trust bypass in Intel's boot card um, that uh, they are still working on mitigating. Um, we went through disclosure with them about 150 days, and finally they they said it's taking too long for them, and we, we were uh, cleared to go ahead and present it at Hack in the Box in Amsterdam um, uh, a few months ago. So again, this is a, a computer congress, and you all are very technical. So let's talk about how this, uh, this works. And before we get into uh, to the code, I really want to thank the projects that this project depends on, that with a lot of these open source uh, projects, we're not developing it in isolation. We're building on the work that other people are doing that's really uh, valuable. Uh, in this case, we're using the open source FPGA tool chain of uh, Yosis Project Trilist and Next PNR that has completely revolutionized how FPGA development is being done. Um, and I'm really excited that uh, there's now a completely open source way to work with uh, this sort of programmable hardware. I uh, also want to thank uh, the folks at RevSpace, uh, the hackerspace in Den Haag, for letting me hang out there and work uh, with some of them while we were developing uh, th these tools, specifically uh, Alyssa Milburn and uh, um, Peter Bosch. The, what we developed at RevSpace for the Hack in the Box demo was based on a small ICE-40 FPGA. It has one megabit of block RAM, which isn't enough to store the whole, uh, the whole uh, firmware image, but it was enough to do our proof of concept for the time of check, time of use. In order to store the full one, we need something bigger. And again, the Hackerspaces uh, came through and, and delivered uh, a, a wonderful open source FPGA board. This is from a Croatian hackerspace uh, that has a ECP5 FPGA and 32 megabytes of uh, DRAM that we can read and write from at about 250 megabytes per second. Um, SDRAM, or DRAM in general, is a really complex uh, sort of um, uh, a design. It has all of these sort of dark magic uh, state transitions that you have to deal with um, in order to be able to uh, interface with it. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm lazy. I don't want to have to implement that. But again, there's a wonderful open source tool that people have uh, put out there. Um, Stefan uh, Christensen uh, wrote and published a, a modular uh, SDRAM bit of Verilog that we were able to interface excuse me, we were able to merge into SpySpy and get working on the ECP5. I also want to give thanks to Scanlime, uh, who, as with many projects, had already done something very similar. Uh, back in 2009, she was emulating a Nintendo DS uh, save cartridge, which is a very small uh, spy flash that's read at a very slow speed. But she documented enough of the protocol that it made it very easy for us to build on her work to uh, build a, our emulator. So let's talk about what that protocol looks like. Um, 
uh, I mentioned that uh, it's important to notice where the dot is on the chip, because in the data sheet that tells us which one is uh, going to be pin one. Um, and I mentioned it's a four wire protocol. Um, obviously the power and ground is very important, but the, the uh, chip select line is the one that tells the, the flash chip when it's uh, time that it's the, uh, the x86 wants to talk to it. And while that's low, uh, the chip is selected. So we would say this is a active low signal. And we designate that with either a, uh, an exclamation mark or a uh, pound sign in the name. Uh, the next pin we need is the clock, uh, which um, uh, is moving at some speed controlled by the x86. And the data lines are, uh, are, are clocked on the rising edge. They're, they're sorted into the registers. So we would call this rising edge clocked. Uh, and then this, uh, the serial inline is from the, from the x86. And the protocol typically consists of a command byte followed by some number of uh, address bytes. And then the spy flash responds on the serial outline with uh, some number of uh, data bytes as well. And again, those are also rising edge clocked. If we go into the data sheet, we can see the uh, read command, um, which is what most of the bulk of uh, what we saw scrolling by were. Um, and these have a uh, three byte address uh, into the flash. Three bytes gives you two to the 24th uh, or 16 megabytes. And on the wire, we would typically see the 0, 3, followed by the 24 bits, followed by then uh, up to 256 bytes of uh, response data uh, that get clocked out. And the Verilog code that we used for the Hack in the Box demo looked sort of like this, pretty, um, this is a little bit abbreviated. But basically, on every rising edge of the spy clock, we, uh, we shift an address bit in from the data in line. We increment the number of bits we've received. And if we've received uh, 23 bits, then we, uh, we look up in our block RAM for the, um, the data at that address, and we shift it out the data out register. This worked wonderfully on the, uh, the ICE-40 with uh, one megabit of block RAM. We were able to do our, our very small proof of concept. But when we tried doing this with the DRAM, it didn't work. What we ended up seeing is that the first bit uh, coming out from that DRAM, when we clocked it out on the data outline, was delayed by about 50 nanoseconds from the uh, rising edge of the clock. And that meant that we didn't meet timing and the system just wouldn't even start up. It wouldn't boot because the data uh, were almost always corrupted. And the reason for that is due to the way reads happen in DRAM. That what we think of as an atomic operation where we say, you know, index some address into the RAM happens over multiple clock cycles, where on the first clock cycle, uh, the row is addressed. Um, and this is typically uh, uh, 12 bits out of it. Then some number of clock cycles later, a column from that row is addressed. And this has to do with the way DRAM is implemented. It has to copy values from a bunch of capacitors into registers, uh, and then you can read from those registers. Um, and this latency is typically five to seven DRAM clocks, or you know, 50 to 100 nanoseconds. And what's really interesting is this doesn't depend on the speed of the DRAM. That if you go to your, your brand new uh, PC with uh, 2.5, four gigahertz uh, G, um, DDR4, it probably takes about 100 nanoseconds to do a random read. It's just that caches do a good job of hiding that. But in this case, we don't know what the cache, is, what the read performance is going to be. So uh, this is not going to work for us. Um, and the problem that we're running into is we don't control the clock. It's being controlled by the x86 that's talking to the flash emulator. So we basically have from the rising edge of that 24th bit uh, to the falling edge of the clock to get a, some data available, which at a, a uh, 20 megahertz um, spy clock means we have to have a result in about 25 nanoseconds or less. Luckily, 
we have an open source memory controller that we're using. So we can modify it to let us do these sorts of things. Uh, in this case, what we do is we can detect once we've received uh, 14 bits of the address, we can actually go ahead and kick off the row activation. Once we've received uh, another nine bits of the address, we can do the column read uh, from that row. And then uh, we get back 16 bits from that column, which means that uh, on the fall-in edge, we can select either the upper or lower byte from, from that result and write it out to, uh, to the data outline. And this actually worked. Uh, we're only about 10 nanoseconds slower than the real flash chip, which is enough to meet the timing, the set up and hold timing requirements for, this, uh, for, for the read. Um, and at a 20 megahertz clock. So we, we do actually have to cheat a little bit and um, not let the x86 run that clock faster. But luckily, that's a configuration in that flash descriptor. I think the one of the things I'm most proud about with this project is that uh, White Quark said, called it impressive. And she is an incredibly gifted hardware engineer. And for her to, uh, to say that you know, made me very, very proud. So if we go back and look at that, that waveform, we can actually read uh, the, the data stream that's going. And the 010110 you know, works out to be 5AA5. If we look at the, the hex in the uh, the hex dump of the, the ROM, we can see that appears there on the uh, in the Intel flash descriptor. And based on what uh, uh, Butterworth and uh, Kova uh, documented in their advanced BIOS training, this is the valid flash descriptor. The CPU won't start up if that read doesn't come in. So getting that one to work was you know, the first key, sort of key victory in, in getting the spy spy to function. Unfortunately, it wasn't reliable. That a lot of times we could get most of the way into the firmware, but we'd frequently get sort of uh, bad, uh, bad errors or CRC errors or um, decompression errors on on the firmware. And this has to do with another quirk of DRAM, which is that there's a auto refresh cycle that every 7.8 microseconds uh, you send. Uh, you need to do a, a refresh command, which will choose a row from the, uh, from the RAM, copy it from capacitors to registers, and then copy it back to the capacitors. And this has to do with the fact that DRAM uh, capacitors are slowly losing charge. So you have to continuously uh, reread them and refresh them. Um, luckily, we have an open source DRAM controller. So we were able to add uh, to the uh, to the interface to it, an additional input line that says uh, hold off on doing a refresh. You know, we, we're going to need the flat the memory very very soon. So when we get a read command, we can assert this this wire into the uh, into the DRAM controller, and it won't it guarantees that we won't have any refresh cycles while the x86 is trying to read from us. Um, so you might have noticed that we are using a solderless flash uh, or chip clip um, when we put it on, on the board. And you might be thinking, but why doesn't the, the real flash chip uh, respond? You know, how, how, do we, uh, how do we override it? And it turns out that on most of these main boards, the, uh, the spy flash uh, uh, pins are connected via small series resistors uh, to the uh, the PCH or the x86. So as long as we can sync more current than the PCH, we can change the value of this of this line. And because there's that resistor, it it, it doesn't cause any damage to anything. So schematically, this is what the spy spy looks like. Uh, when the PCH, the x86, uh, asserts the, C the chip select line, uh, both the x86, both the spy flash and the FPGA uh, pick that up. Um, the spy flash starts asserting data on the serial outline, but the FPGA drives the uh, the, the CS line high, which then causes the the real spy flash to turn off its output driver essentially releasing the bus. And then the FPGA is able to uh, send data on the bus without worrying about 
uh, damaging the output drivers. The drawback is we can't tell when the, spot, when the PCH has stopped asserting the CS line. So we, we instead have a, a, a little bit of a hack that we watch the clock line. And uh, once it, we haven't seen a clock toggle for some number of nanoseconds, we assume the PCH is no longer engaged in the transaction. And we can then unassert the CS and let the bus go back into the state where the, um, the platform controller hub can, uh, can turn it on and off. So we have this working on laptops, as you saw. Um, we also have it working on quite a few different server platforms that we've worked on. And if we zoom way into that, uh, that, that first server mainboard uh, that I put up, you'll see that there are actually two flash chips, one for the x86 and then one for the board management controller, which is, in this case, an ARM CPU that uh, run, and most of the time runs Linux. Uh, we now have, uh, as of last week, support for uh, override, doing the same trick to override the chip select line on the um, uh, on the A speed uh, 2400 series and 2500 series uh, ARM CPUs, which means we can use the Spy Spy not only for uh, core boot, Linux boot, and UEFI research, but also for things like OpenBMC and MicroBMC uh, to help accelerate the firmware development there. And that, that works on the, this particular Supermicro board, um, which is also supported by core boot. So if you want a fully open uh, server, this is one to, to check out. You might notice that everything I've talked about has been uh, somewhat Intel specific. Um, we're, we are working uh, with a group in Berlin on supporting the AMD CPUs. Uh, we have support for booting the, uh, the PSP, which is Intel's version of the management engine off of SpySpy. Spy. Um, and this is going to enable some interesting security research there because much like the management engine, the PSP is a hardware root of trust that uh, potentially can uh, be key to a lot of security uh, issues. It is open source, so we would love for you all to uh, help out. Um, there are quite a few things that uh, we don't support right now, um, but if, if you have a system that needs dual or quad spy or fast read, or if you want to help us with the user interface, or maybe support other buses like the LPC bus or eSpy, um, you know, we'd love to be able to turn this into a, a, a Swiss Army knife of bus, uh, man in the middle, and talk uh sort of projects. So you can check it out from GitHub. You can join us on uh, the open source firmware Slack. Um, I'm also love to take questions via Mastodon or Twitter. And with that, I'd like to open the floor up to any questions. And also to reassemble the, uh, the victim laptop. Hi. So first of all, congrats. These are really a couple of really great hacks. And so my question is, does this then open a door for running core boot on laptops newer than uh, 230? Because if I understood correctly from your uh, slide with the uh, first time and second time of uh, reading the uh, the memory, we could just, uh, the first time that it reads, we could just give him the original firmware and the uh, next time we could just run the uh, core boot. Yes, so the question is, can can the Spy Spy or something similar be used to uh, enable core boot on boot guard equipped laptops? And yes, you can use this uh, on most uh, I've successfully done so on a variety of uh, ThinkPads. The, um, uh, the X1 Gen 6 was the one that I was using in that particular attack. Um, it would require a hardware implant because bypassing boot card is a per boot sort of thing. Um, but using, uh, I, I built a small mock-up with the ICE40 UP 5K uh, that would actually fit underneath a spy flash chip. And you could then solder on top. Uh, 
it's somewhat inspired by my BMC hardware implant talk that I gave at Congress uh, last year. Um, uh, the other option, however, is if uh, the Nine Elements folks are have a core boot port for the T80, excuse me, the T480S, um, which is a brand new boot guard equipped one that they've been able to get without boot guard enabled, uh, direct from Lenovo. Um, no, just a small question. The ThinkPad that you flashed basically to a new bootstrap, um, are you going to flash it back? Or do you, uh, uh, is it going to flash it back itself? There were no changes made to the ThinkPad. Once the clip is removed, uh, it is back ah. to the, um, it, it will boot from the, the, uh, usual. the usual flash. Ah. So it's, it's a, um, it's useful both for uh, firmware development and evil made attacks. Uh huh, okay. Yeah, there it goes, normal firmware. Can you, can you dump the BIOS and flash me the Balkan uh, core boot edition, please? <laughs> I didn't actually verify that it boots. It did look like it got into Grub, but I'm not sure about the <laughs> how if it uh, goes the rest of the way. However, and you can also flash with the tool the stuff on the chip, or only read out and override. Uh, right now, the Verilog only supports the uh, uh, the emulation mode, but that that's a would be a useful feature to add. Is something that would say read out the current contents of the chip to pre-populate the DRAM let you tweak just a few pieces of it, test it, and then maybe write that back to the flash. That, that would be a, a good feature to add. Um, feel free to open a GitHub issue and uh, uh, assign this yourself. Thank you very much. If I have some free time left, we can speak about it. Is there any sort of sensible mitigation that um, the manufacturers wanted to do to prevent the sort of evil made attacks you were talking about? <laughs> so uh, Intel boot guard it does a, a really good job of preventing a lot of evil made attacks, uh, firmware level evil made attacks, just because it does provide a root of trust in hardware uh, change from the, the management engine uh, into the x86. So that largely has eliminated uh, evil made firmware attacks for systems that have it enabled. Um, uh, other vendors are taking a different approach. For instance, uh, uh, Apple has their uh, the T2 uh, security coprocessor that is doing a very similar thing to the Spy Spy, where it is doing firmware validation uh, prior to releasing the x86 from reset and then delivering this validated firmware over eSpy to the x86. Th that's a really neat way to do it. Unfortunately, it's closed source. It's a proprietary solution that only works on their proprietary platform. Um, Google has done a similar thing with the Chromebooks that they have their Titan uh, chip that uh, replaces both sort of the embedded controller and the TPM and a few other functions. Um, and it does a similar validation prior to releasing uh, reset, at least in the server class ones. In the Chromebook ones, I think it only does validation at, uh, at firmware load time. That they're, they're not, evil made physical attacks are not in the Chromebook security model. Um, Microsoft Cerberus has a, also some similar things, but uh, currently vaporware as far as actual chips for end users. Any more questions? All right, well, I will be around all week, so if you have laptops and you want to try it out, um, love to uh, uh, test it on a variety of them. Um, and again, uh, feel free to connect on a variety of uh, uh, places and love to chat further.